Well, good morning. It really, really is so good to be here. I must say it's one of the highlights of our year to come to the USA and particularly to come to Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> so we love you guys. You know, we, we don't feel like guest speakers. We really do yeah. feel like we are part of the family. Yeah. Amen. And isn't that amazing what God does? I mean, here we're from Hong Kong. And what was the chances of us... Meeting you guys and meeting you guys and Bill and Von. I mean, God is so amazing who he, in his divine connections, he kind of links you with people who have got the same heart. And Shane, you guys as well. I mean, it's just wonderful what God's doing. He's building his family. And, you know, we're known as brothers and sisters because that is so personal. And he's our father. But we're also known as the family of God in the church. And... Wherever, you know, we can go to places and immediately, you like we go to Central Asia and we we go into there. And I mean, all of them like speak Russian. Sorry, Donald, but don't mention the Russians. Okay. (laughs) I did once, but I thought I got away with it. So don't tell anyone. But we go there and we can't speak their language, but our hearts are one. We're connected. And that's what God does. And so for us... Oh, just as well I'm tiny, I can creep through all these little spaces. Um, I'm a good Hong Kong Chinese. You should see the crowds there. Honestly, you could be so overwhelmed, and I've learned how to push my way through. I'm very rude there because they're rude. And if I'm polite, I'm left. If I'm polite, I'm left, and everybody's like pushed into the, the train, and I'm like left on the platform. So I just push with them. I put my hand on their, their lower back and I just push them and I get in. And um, they like look around and they say, oh, mad guala, you know, mad, guala. Uh, mad white person. <laughs> they think the word guala, guala is white ghost. The, yeah, white ghost. That's how they see us. White ghosts. But anyway, that's, I don't know why I'm saying all that, but anyway, it's good to be here. And uh, we've had a great Uh, Two days, and today the finale, um, it's not really the finale because actually every Sunday is the finale, you know. We just, God's so amazing. You know, with His grace, we can do so much more. We can go further. We can persevere. We can uh, take on the challenges. We can go deeper into Him. There is just so much to experience with God. You know, we so limit Him, but I just feel in this time here, our our imagination and our spirits and our thinking has been opened yeah. even more. You guys are already open, but I'm just saying, you know, there's always more. There's more in God. We don't have to settle. We've, God wants to take us deeper, further, yes. higher. In this community, in this city, yeah. who was saying it? I don't know. Somebody was saying, like, what God's going to do here in Alabama, Trish, I think. Yeah. And we really do believe that. That's right. That... Um, We are going to see some amazing things happen in Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, yeah. And I'm looking forward. I don't know if we're coming back next year. I don't know if there's an invite. I'm not being (laughs) presumptuous at all. But we, whether we're invited or not, we (laughs) are praying for you. We are praying for you. We are encouraging you from the sidelines. And we just love um, Mark and Jenny. Uh, They're just such a delight. And Trish and Mark and Bill and Vaughn and so many of you, we've got to actually know you. You feel like family to us. And I know I'm taking a long time, but I just want to say, I don't get a lot of time to speak. So, (laughs) and, but I want to send you greetings from our church in Hong Kong um, because they prayed. (laughs) They prayed for this time, and do you know that this morning, well, yeah, this morning, but it was yesterday for them, this timeline thing is crazy, the date line, but anyway, they're in tonight, tomorrow, whatever, but at church on Sunday morning for them, suddenly this huge typhoon came through. On the Saturday, it was a beautiful day, beautiful skies. Sunday morning, they get up to go to church, and there's a T8, which means typhoon. Eight is very, very high. You only get a 10, so it was on eight, and so all the public transport stops. Everything comes to a halt. 
But you know, my, my daughter sent us a text and said, Mom, we just sent an email out, uh, Facebook, and we just said, church is still on. <laughs> so how they got there, I don't know, because public transport closes down and that, but they were there. We had more than half of our people at church, and God turned up. So this is what the grace of God does, you know. It helps you to go further. It gives you such a desire that you just, you know, you just want to meet together. Amen. Anyway, I think I've said enough, but it's great to be here. Thank you. And Rob, we're looking forward to this morning, what you've got to preach. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's give the benediction and the, the grace of the Lord. <laughs> I love hearing my wife speak, I'll be honest. And uh, I suppose it's good to be honest if you're preaching. <laughs> I'm not preaching now, I'm just telling the truth. Okay. <laughs> But I, I find it so funny. She says, I have, "I have so little. I have so little. I have so little opportunity to say things." <laughs> Thank you, Glenda. <laughs> well, congratulations, uh, Life of Faith Church, for hosting such an, a healthy and uh, conference of substance. Not uh, because of our ministry, but because of the context that we've been able to speak into, it has a capacity to multiply the investment of our impartation. So that's why it is such a privilege. And I love the continuity of being in places sequentially because you are building and uh, you're advancing and you are recognizing um, the stages that churches are going through and you're partnering and coming alongside that. And so you know, I recognized in, in, in Rock and, Je and Jenny the first time we came. And I know some people don't understand this language or think it's religious or weird or it's some kind of um, mystical title. But I recognize an apostolic grace over their lives. And uh, apostles are not superior to prophets or teachers or evangelists or pastors. And they're not superior to the believers in Christ, to royal priests. It's just a function. It's not a title. Paul the Apostle never called himself Apostle Paul, not once in Scripture. He always made it clear that apostle is a function, it's not his title. And so he always said, Paul called by the grace of God to be an apostle. And it and really is when the Bible says that God has set in the church first apostles, then prophets, it's not because apostles are at the top of the hierarchy, they're actually at the bottom of the hierarchy. They're first because they are the foundation layers of the church. Prophets and apostles are the foundations of the church with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And it's pastors and teachers and evangelists that are working on the apostolic prophetic foundation that build the house well and the royal priests get well equipped. So, so I see in them a function and a flow and a grace of the apostolic, which is a grace to bring divine order and divine government. You know, the church does need river banks because a river without river banks immediately becomes a swamp. And the swamp stinks and it's got some alligators in there and all kinds of horrible things in there, mosquitoes and horrible things. And so you need government, you need divine order that's not controlling, it's not restricting, it's empowering and it's liberating. And that's what they are. They've got that grace. Apostles connect other leaders together. Apostles appoint elders, by the way. Nowhere in the New Testament are elders appointed by votes or by democracy in the church. They are recognized by the grace gifting of apostles. Apostles tend to connect leaders together and build collaborations and cooperations. They do not build denominations. They do not have a headquarters. They do not have ownership of the buildings. They are people that recognize gifts and functions of others, and they've got a grace to build people into a co in a co in a not a coercive way, in a in in a, in a in a way of cooperating together, and we multiply the gospel across the earth. And I'm watching it over the last three years. I've watched leaders coming in here. Apostles attract other leaders of caliber into the house, and they build a base church that begins to resource other churches and begins to advance the gospel into other regions and into other nations. Paul the Apostle's ambition was always to go where the gospel had not gone and to take the gospel step by step further and further. So all I want to say is uh, Life of Faith Church, the borders of the kingdom did not end at the boundaries of this local church. The world is your parish. The nations of your inheritance. You are the seed of Abraham and you are capacitated to bless 
Birmingham, to bless Alabama, to bless the United States, all 50 states, and to bless the nations of the earth. And when you have a vision for the nations, you will receive the caliber of divine resources to be able to do that. If you've got a small vision and it's just about yourself, which you guys are not about, then God will give you appropriate resources to do a little thing. But if you want to be the seed of Abraham, which you are, by the way, for whoever belongs to Christ, is, is the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. So I will bless you, Abraham. I'll bless your seed and I'll make you a blessing to all nations. Yeah. Not some nations, to all nations. So when Jesus said, I, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, now you go and make disciples of all nations. He is just confirming the oath that God swore to Abraham. So, life of faith church, you are the seed of Abraham and heirs of the nations of the earth. Amen. And to come now for the third time and realize that the first two conferences were different because we were changing gears. We were having to deal with some things and tear some ideas down and establish the revelation of grace. That's a set now. That's established now. So this conference had a totally different dynamic. This was a conference of building on the healthy foundations that you have in this house. And let me tell you, it's such a joy to see the progress. If you haven't seen your friend's kids for a couple of years, next time you see them, you're so amazed how much they've grown up. The parents have been growing with them, but when you come in as a friend, you go, wow, the kids are growing up. And they go, really? And we come, you know, once a year, and we just see how you've grown, and you've matured, and there's more stability, there's more security, there's more strength, and there's more cohesiveness and connectedness, and you're advancing in the gospel. So we say we commend you. Well done. Congratulations. In Jesus' name. I want to talk uh, today, um, if I can, on, on the vision that Jesus has for his church. Now, I don't want to preach today, but if you go quiet, I might go into that prophetic, aggressive preaching mode, which my wife doesn't like. She likes me the gentle person. No, no, she does like me when I get aggressive too, but it's not an unkind aggression. It's kind of like a holy aggression, if I can make it so sanctimonious. Okay. <laughs> But, but I, I, I don't expect you to be different to what you are as a culture in your house. But when I speak, there's always an anointing. Every preacher who's called of God should have an anointing. As they get up to speak, something comes on them, not for their benefit, but the benefit of those that are listening. And like the woman touched the garment of Jesus and she pulled the power out of Jesus herself. He didn't push it into her. He wasn't even praying for her. She pulled it out of him. Now hundreds were touching him and they got nothing because they weren't expecting anything and they weren't pulling anything. But she got an issue of blood completely healed because she made a demand on the anointing in the garments of Jesus. So when I speak now, I want you to make a demand on the grace of God, on the gift, on the anointing God's put on me. And you will not drain me. Don't feel sorry for me because you will take what I've been given to give to you. All right. But unless you pull on it and say amen now and again or a woman if you want or a person <laughs> to be politically correct or just say, yeah, Rob, preach that. Because I love Southern hospitality. It is real. It's not a theory. You guys are really, really kind people. And you make me cry the way you talk to me after the services. And thank you so much for coming. I'm going, this is such a pleasure to be here. What do you mean? So, but do say amen right now and again. Give a clap every now and again. Not to pander to my insecurity, but to exalt Jesus. And to agree with the truth. Come on now. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap just for the heaven of it. So, the vision Jesus has for the church you know, uh, I love my wife. She is my bride. The church in Ephesians 5 is called the bride of Christ. And my, my wife, been married to her for 42 years, just like me, I go through difficult times and I'm not always myself. And my wife is such a beautiful person inside and out. And there's times she goes through difficult times. Times of betrayal, where she's betrayed, and people just can be quite cruel at times, and they don't think about what their words mean, and and uh, it's it's like sometimes it's a bit of a war zone on the front line of the kingdom, traveling to nations and pouring out your heart, and we're so grateful to do it, but sometimes my wife is not at her best, and imagine if someone who sees her not at her best says to me, Rob, I love you, but I really don't like Linda. It will make me pretty angry, friends. 
Because I know who she really is. And even if she's not at her best, I still know who she is and how wonderful she is. Now, it's easy to criticize the church. If you look down through all the centuries, the church has had highs and the church has had lows. And we can say, well, I love you, Jesus, but I don't like your bride. Please don't think that makes Jesus feel pleasure. Because he knows who we are. He knows who his bride is. He knows her potential. And he knows what the outcome of his vision for his church. Just remember, you are the church. You didn't come to church this morning. The church came to this building. And so anyone who criticizes the church, even if they're not criticizing this church, they're criticizing you because you are part of the church. Amen. And if you don't know the purpose of something, you will always abuse it. You must know the purpose of something to participate and partner in a pure way, in a profound priority as to what the pleasure of that purpose is. But if you don't know the purpose of the church or the vision, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the head of the church has for his church, then we will abuse church. If I think that Glenda's elegant high heels that are made to make her legs look beautiful to me and me alone. <laughs> if I think the purpose of her elegant, delicate high heels is to hit nails into the wall. That is an abuse of the purpose. And Glenda will take a real hammer and hammer some common sense into my head. No, she wouldn't hit my head with that. Okay, just in case. And so let's talk about the church. How many of you realize that the church is the reasons why nations rise and fall? The church is not an afterthought. I love Israel. I've been to Jerusalem. I've been across Israel. And I love the people of Israel. I love the Jewish people. But God's intent was not to demonstrate to the principalities and powers his manifold wisdom through Israel or through the nation of Israel. It's not what the scripture says. The church is not an afterthought that God thought, well, Israel has rejected me, so I'll play around with my plan B, the church. And when Israel turns and, and repents and recognizes Messiah, then I'll put the church aside and make my plan A, Jew, the Jews, the nation of Israel, most important. Now, friends, from Ephesians chapter 1, it says that God blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus. And he says, before the foundation of the world, he decided to see us holy, perfect, without condemnation, and without accusation in Christ Jesus. Not outside Christ, but in him. Before you were lost in first Adam, you were found in Christ before the foundation of the world. Because that means you're still going to get saved, by the way, in time. But anyway, what, what he's saying he predestinated us according to his love to be highly esteemed and adopted in the beloved Christ Jesus. And he lavished on us the, the glorious riches of his grace that, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So the church was his idea, his plan before the foundation of the world. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse, 9, uh, verse 10 and verse 11, the Bible says that God's intent is that now through the church, not through an apostle, not through Israel, not through a ministry, but God's intent, I'm quoting clearly from scripture accurately, God's intent is that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known and revealed to the powers and authorities according to his eternal purpose that he has accomplished in Christ. Every economic system, every political system, every commercial agenda throughout all of history rises and falls on the basis of one thing and one thing only. Does it facilitate and precipitate God's eternal purpose for the church? And so the church is mentioned, I, I don't know if you get this, so please let me just say it again. What kind of group of people would God select? Because 
Church means ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones that are separated from the corrupted wisdom of this fallen age. And they are to live by wisdom from above, citizens of the United States, but ultimately citizens of heaven, seated in the heavenly realms, separated and called out and assigned and consecrated to be a called out community that do not segregate themselves from the world geographically, but they separate themselves from the world spiritually. And they are of another origin. They are not of this world. They are not created from the source of this world's creation. They are not seeded from first Adam's fallenness and corruption, but we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We are an entirely different species of human beings. We are a separated people called out to be part of that which is his eternal purpose. His intention to reveal the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers. And principalities and powers are supernatural spirit rulers, angels, and, and illegitimate illegal authorities. But principalities and powers also speak of those influences that, cre that, that develop and build the culture of politics, of education, how the world system does marriage, how the world system does commerce, how the world system does morals, how the world system prioritizes the world system's corrupted agendas built on selfish ambitions and strife and insecurity and all kinds of corruptness. The world system is built in and under these principalities and powers. And these principalities and powers are gloating and boasting how they stole God's agenda in the Garden of Eden and how they've won the world and how they have conquered and crushed mankind to conform to the pattern of this world because they're under principalities and powers. And in the midst of this chaos and corruption, God's got a plan. It's not an individual gifted ministry. It's not Israel. It's not an apostle. It is a multi-membered corporate church, the people of a heavenly society, the new creation people who are salt and light you are a light set up on a hill for all to see the light of God rise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you in the times of deep darkness your glory will shine and nations will come to the dawning of your light kings and queens and people of influence will come to the dawning of your light your sons will come from far away and the wealth of the nations will come to you because of the dawning of your light rise shine your light has come is speaking to your people. The lights come and they haven't risen. They haven't, re they haven't responded. They haven't understood. We are the people of God. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are the glorious riches of His inheritance. We are righteous in Christ. We are an eternal people. We are aliens on earth passing through this corrupted planet that is a climax and a consummation and an end and a conclusion and will all be summed up in Christ Jesus. We are not just a social club. We are not knocking nails into the wall with our wife's little fragile thing. We are not abusing the purpose of the church because we are taking the time to hear what Jesus, the King of Kings, what is His vision for His house. And no other foundation should we lay. And no other church should we have except the church that He died for and gave Himself for. Come on, say amen. You're part of the church. You are no longer part of this world, but you're to be salt and light in this world. You are to lift this world, give hope to this world, be a people, a gathered company of people. Amen. Yes. And so before the cross, the church is only mentioned twice before the cross. In the, in the four gospels, it's mentioned twice, but both mentions are in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 18 and Matthew 16. In Matthew 18, it's very clear, Jesus is talking about a local church. And in Matthew 16, he's talking about the universal church. This is a local church. The universal church is the church that began on the day of Pentecost and will be here when Jesus comes back again. And I'm sorry for extreme preterists, he hasn't come back again yet. That's right. That's right. If this is the great millennial age or if this is the age of glory... Tell that to the people in Syria. Tell that to half the three quarters of the population of the world. Now he's coming back again. 
So in the local church, see, I, do you mind if I just get really basic here today and make this clear? Because I, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence or assume any ignorance here. I'm not assuming ignorance. But as I travel the world, I often water down what I'm saying because I think I should say this, but oh, everyone knows that, so I don't say it. Then when people come and ask me questions, I realize, boy, you better, you really better make this basic because it seems like people need some education and equipping in some of the very basics of the kingdom because religion has failed the world. It's just taught people religion, but there's revelation. You can know this Bible back to front. You can know it, but it won't help you one little bit. Yeah, this book has to be revealed by the Spirit. So the local church is in Matthew 18 because we know it's local because they're talking about practical issues, how you resolve issues. There's a whole pattern. There's a prescribed pattern how God works. You see, the kingdom is a divine government. And the kingdom has legislation. It doesn't have democracy because it's a kingdom. It's the dominion of a king, but he's a very good king, perfectly kind father. Amen. So there is a kingdom has a dominion and it has a government. It has legislation. It has organization and it's, it is organized and there's an administration. The kingdom of God's not chaos. The kingdom of God is not what you eat or drink, but is righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, the kingdom. So the church is the agency of the kingdom. Do not separate the church from the kingdom and say, well, church is nice, but I don't really like going to church, but I want to do the works of the kingdom. No, you cannot do that. And I'll explain that a little while later. But the church, you understand that the church is, is, is neither organic or institutional. People, you've got to understand this because I hear stuff <clears throat> that I cannot believe people are saying if they read their Bibles and have revelation. You see, you need two poles and you cannot polarize around one pole or you'll sterile yourself. You'll make yourself, you'll, you'll cauterize yourself, you'll castrate yourself. You will lose your fruitfulness. You need two poles. There's a North Pole and there's a South Pole and there's an energy created by bipolar. This is the healthy bipolar. <laughs> you have a left brain and a right brain. Let me tell you, if one of your poles on the left side dies or one on the right hand side dies, you've got a stroke happening and you are incomplete. Don't go hard on me now, please. <laughs> Electricity has to have two poles in order for energy to flow. You need two gender poles in order to have a baby. You need two poles to produce more people. And the church is neither institutional, neither is it organic. It's both. And some people want to polarize around organic, and it's very weird. <laughs> I call them the Gnostics. The scriptures call them the Gnostics. It's for them, organization and planning is a curse word. They just believe, it just, I just fly to Jesus. And, and we, we just, we don't have to plan anything. And we don't meet if we don't feel like it. And we just, if there's two or three of us, that's the church. Two or three is not a church. It's a prayer meeting. <laughs> the church has government. It has riverbanks. It has divine order. Don't abuse the vision Jesus has for his church by polarizing around this organic thing. You know, and, and you just, if you want to have coffee on Sunday morning under a tree, that's church. You are hitting a wall in. You're hitting hammer, you're hammering nails in with a fragile. You are you're abusing. You are misrepresenting the reason why Jesus spilled his guts on the cross. He went through all of that, not for you to meet under a coffee tree. <laughs> that organic is so strange. Then on the other side, the church polarizes around what I would call technocrats. And they, they, for them, everything's organized. Everything's scripted. Everything is over-engineered. In fact, they just, they over-engineer, they engineer God right out of the picture. God's not there anymore. Because everything's scripted. Everything's choreographed. But friends, the church is organic and the church is organizational. 
The church has two poles, and they, they, they operate in a holy tension. They operate in a holy balance. And when the church comes in that, it produces so much life. We believe in organizing. We believe in planning. God plans, friends. God planned the whole of creation and only brought Adam into creation on the evening of the sixth day. And everything was planned for Adam and ready for Adam. And he had a rest on his first day on earth. Because the Father planned everything. You can rest a lot better when you plan well. So we plan. This conference didn't just organically happen. There was planning. There was sacrifice. There were volunteers who could have been doing something else, but they chose, I'm going to be part of that. I'm going to invest into the purpose of Jesus for the church. We don't preach ecclesiology. We preach Christology. We preach in Christ, but Christ's passion is the church. You see, in the problem with Gnostics and technocrats is they've got, the pro their problem is they've got scripture. So that it's when you stand on a on a on, on something a scale that tells you your weight, and if you look at it, you see three hundred pounds. You can either grab this. You got two choices: smash the scales. I hate you, you lying spirit. I'm so offended with you. How dare you make me feel bad by telling me the truth? Identity politics. You're making me feel bad. This is racist. You're picking on my white skin now. <laughs> or you could be intelligent and sensible, a like common sense, which isn't so common anymore. Because <laughs> corrupted worldly thinking is literally being toxic in people's brains. Have you seen on TV how people are speaking at the moment? The philosophies and what they subscribe, and Christians are there with them. It's like something's going wrong. They, they, they're not, they don't have two poles operating. <laughs> or you could just go, you know what? That's the truth. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going on some stupid drastic diet. I'm just going to go on a wise, progressive diet that will help me lose weight progressively over a year in something sustainable and a little bit of light exercise. I will adjust to truth. I will not tell truth to adjust to me. When you when you're rubbing up the cat the wrong way, you go, oh, it's fur just gets in trying to bite you. And people say, well, we'll turn the cat around, and then you'll you'll just rub it the right way, and it'll be happy. You'll go. But friends, the kingdom of heaven is not God trying to colonize the earth. An illegitimate being colonized what belonged to God. The earth is God's. And the devil came and deceived Adam and Eve and took over the cultural effect and the cultural formation of this planet. The book of Revelation said he's deceived the whole world. And so the church is counter to the culture of this world. Because we are not of this world. I don't want to be relevant to this world. I am relevant to the world I come from. I am no longer from this world. I am from a new creation. I have been born from above. And I am an ambassador of the highest government in the universe. Authorized to say to rebel planet earth. Repent and come into the obedience of faith. Come into grace. But repent for the corrupted wisdom of this world. For you repent and come into the church. That God's eternal intent through Christ Jesus. Is through the church to reveal his magnified manifold wisdom. To the powers and authorities. That have been inv influencing the philosophy and the thinking of this world system. And the more the church is compromises and conforms to the world, the more the world goes faster into darkness. Because right. salt and light is insulting and lighting. It's just enjoining the world. And then it goes to church on Sunday, reads the Bible, and lives worldly. 
Worldly isn't having a glass of wine or going to the movies. Worldly is thinking without revelation. It is thinking without divine reasoning. It is being just conditioned and programmed by the culture you grew up in. But when you repent, it means change your way of thinking. Change the conditioning of how you grew up, how you saw things before you were saved. Amen. You guys are listening so well. So the problem with people who want to just Gnostic, organic, technocrat, over-organize, the problem with scriptures. In the same verse in the Bible, the Bible will bring in something that's organic and something that's institutional. Because the church is institutional, friends. Institutional is not a swear word. And some people on Facebook, they make it a swear word. But the problem is they're going to devalue scripture. In the same verse, Paul will say, Peter would say, you are living stones. Living is the mysterious part. It is the dynamic part. It is the revelational dimension. Stones is the static part. Stones is the institutional part. Stones is the building part. Stones is the practical part. Stones is the building together. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 to the church, he says, you are God's field. You are God's building in the same verse. Field, it's organic. It's mysterious. You throw a seed in there and it comes up with life. Building, static. The church is architectural and the church is artistic. The church is left and right. The church needs to balance these things and come into a texture of sanity because we're seeing insane stuff going around the world. There's such a dismissing of the value of the church by Christians. Why? Because the church has done bad things in the past and the church has failed and it's been toxic. But I want to say, when you say that thing about my wife, I know who she is. I know what she's made of. I know her potential. Don't say you love me, but you don't love my wife. Don't say you love Jesus, but you don't love his church. Because he loves his church with all of her problems and issues. And he knows his vision for his house. And before the ages are over, his glorious bride will be in the earth. And there shall be fear and awe at the multiplied, magnified wisdom within the house of God. There will be awe in the house of God. There will be this. Oh, this is the church. This is what he died for. Oh, yes, I want to belong to that. But the real people of faith say we're in now before the process is finished. The universal church is in Matthew 16. Now, that is not local. And this is what I want to just develop now. For a little while longer, I hope, oh, help me, Lord. I, what I want to develop right now, for taking on a theology on the church, imagine that. In Matthew 16, you know, Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say you are? And they go, I don't know you, this you, Elijah, Moses, blah, 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 blah. And Peter is normally quite thick. And so I love Peter. I just love how he's got my temperament. I think he's a melancholic idealist. But anyway, he's just, he's so impulsive, Peter. And he's just so like sticks his foot in his mouth, and he just jumps out boats, walks on the water for a while, and sinks, and he doesn't care. He's just like he's going to go for it, you know. He pulls out swords, cuts people's ears off. Jesus, oh, Peter, stop that now. Picks the ear up, puts it back on the guy. Peter, oh, Peter, I'll follow you everywhere, Jesus. Everyone else will deny, not me. <laughs> Jesus, never heard that name before. <laughs> Man, I feel sane when I read about Peter. (laughs) That impulsive idealist. Oh, my God. I love impulsive idealists. I think Donald Trump's an impulsive idealist. (laughs) You know, God told me audibly he'd be the president of the United States. Now, whether you like it or not, you can hate me, but God told me so. (laughs) And I went public on that and told people around the world. I said, I put my ministry online, my credibility. If he's not the president, you can say, I missed that. You know, Peter, just after 
what's happened in Matthew 16, I want to tell you, Jesus said to say, get behind me, said Peter, for you're more concerned about the things of man than the things of God. So you see, you've got to understand, you can have a revelation that lights you up and you see something. But until your mind is completely renewed, you can go from divine reasoning by revelation to worldly reasoning within minutes. And we need to, all through this conference, I've been talking about taking responsibility to monitor your own thought patterns. Taking responsibility to interrupt negative, destructive thoughts. You take responsibility to empower and frame your thinking in an empowering way. No matter what negative things happening to you, whatever bad things happening to you, do not frame your mind in a victim way. Frame your mind in a victorious way. Because you may have your favorite preachers and listen to your favorite preachers, but I want to tell you the preacher that has the most influence on your life is your own way of thinking and your own words to yourself. And speaking the word over your life is the most responsible thing to do. So, so Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Oh! And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father in heaven, revelation knowledge. I didn't think Peter's mind even knew what he was saying. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church built on this rock. Now, it can prevail against the church built on worldly wisdom, but it cannot prevail against the church built on the rock of revelation. And he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever is bound in heaven already, you can bind it on earth. What's ever loosed in heaven, you can loose on earth. So here we've got the church being built on a rock and keys of kingdom given to those who have revelation about the church. You cannot separate church and kingdom. You can't say I'll do the kingdom work, but I'm not part of local church. My friends, you do not have the keys of the kingdom to operate with legitimacy unless you're part of the building of the local church. Do not say Jesus is building the church on his own because Paul says I'm a co-laborer together with Christ in the building of the church. We are co-laboring. Jesus is not building his church in a vacuum. He's not building his church just sovereignly. He's building his church through a partnership with cooperating co-laborers. Amen. So when Peter says, I got revelation, she said, upon this rock, I will not build my, I, I will not, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church built on this rock. What's he talking about? What is that rock? It's the rock of revelation. It's the rock of Christ. But what is he talking about? Did Peter really understand what he was saying by revelation? Because what he's really saying is this rock is a rock that was not cut by human hands. This person, the Christ, the son of the living God, did not come from the seed of fallen Adam. It did not come from the lineage of fallen man, like Buddha and Muhammad and Krishna, Chaitanya Marapabhu and every other guru. They came from a seed of a man that was descendant of first Adam's fallenness and corruption and dead spirit. Every religious leader that's ever walked on this earth was cut from man. But Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit overshadowing a virgin's womb, and he was the rock cut without human hands. And that's what Peter was seeing. This is the Christ. He doesn't, he doesn't have a natural father and the natural lineage of a fallen man. He's not some guru who's corrupted and fallen like us that he slowly got enlightened. He is divine. He comes from God. He comes from the Holy Spirit. He is God the Son. He's not from fallen Adam like the rest of us. He's distinct from all of us. He has the blood of God in him. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And on that rock, I will build my church. It is amazing to me how people say all religions lead to God. What are they talking about? How can someone who's born of a corrupted seed from Adam lead you to God? How can they forgive your sins? What can their blood do for you? What can Buddha's blood do for you? He had a normal father. But Jesus is the rock cut without human hands. And the church that's built on that rock, the gates of hell, the counterculture, the political correctness, the hatred, the unbelief, the secular narrative, 
the bankrupt philosophies of atheism and the emptiness of religious behavior and religious motivations. None of those that have been inspired by principalities and powers can build barriers and gates against the church because it's God's intent that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be revealed to the principalities and powers because it's God's eternal purpose that he's accomplished in Christ to do that. If you do not understand apostolic perception of the church, you will never understand the history of this world because all of history is for one purpose, to produce at the end of the age a glorious church in all of its full manifestation. So please turn to Daniel chapter 2, and I'm looking at the time now. What is that time? Uh, <laughs> you guys okay? You normally could have an hour and a half service. I, I know that. Hey, eh? About that? No comment. <laughs> okay. That's now. <laughs> Okay, thank you guys. You came a long way to uh, hear this message, and we came from Hong Kong to hear this message. So, <laughs> you, you guys, I, I don't know what the offerings are, but you guys have been so generous to us in the previous years, and I, I can tell you this is the truth. Glenda knows this. I'm not being political. We would come if we had to pay our own air ticket and get no offering because we're not about a money motive. This is about the kingdom. It's about divine connections. We resonate in something. There's a chemistry and a synergy. When it, you connect like that, it's come from heaven. Yeah. It's not denominational. It's a relationship. So if you, if you stick with me for a little longer, well, can, can we go to 12? Can we finish at 12? That's a long time. Okay. Okay. And uh, <laughs> You know, my motive is not secret here. My motive is, is not only to make you love the church, but to, to, to inspire your love for the bridegroom, to inspire your love for the one who birthed the church. When that spear was pushed in the side and blood and water came out, God brought Eve out of the side of Adam. He was already, she was already inside of him, and she brought him out of him, not to be inferior to him, they stand together, co-equal in the image and likeness of God. God gave the same authority to Adam as he gave to Eve. They didn't use it. They abused the authority and were lied to. But Eve came out of Adam. We came out of Jesus. Last Adam. So let's, let's have a look at what is this rock cut without human hands. Boy, I love this. Okay, let's read Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading from the NRV, verse 27. We know that Nebuchadnezzar, this wicked king of Babylon, had a dream and a vision. And he said, all the sorcerers and all the magicians, you are not allowed to interpret my dream unless you can tell me what I dreamt without me telling you what I dreamt. That's a big one. <laughs> and so they all fail, and he wants to kill all of them. But Daniel... This Jewish prophet says, I know what to say. So let's read it. Verse 27, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery is asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dreams and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mystery showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching a rock, a rock, everyone say a rock, 
while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away, Holy Spirit, and without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. And then basically it goes on to say that these, what these different metals, the kingdoms they represented, I really believe it represents Babylon, represents the kingdom of Persia, the kingdom, the ancient Greek kingdom, and then the Roman kingdom, and then the Roman kingdom was split in two, and in that time Jesus was born. The rock cut without human hands. And in verse 44, Sorry, yes, 44. In the time of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. We know from the book of Revelations, we hear this statement that John the Apostle heard. And then the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of his Lord and his Christ. It's not just about being on the winning side, friends. It's not having a guarantee in our eschatology of the glorious outcome of the church. But it is a guarantee prophetically that the church will reveal such divine reasoning and wisdom from heaven. The original wisdom that God intended Adam and Eve to have and intended Adam and Eve to replicate and expand Eden-like environments across the planet. But instead they believed the propaganda against the goodness of God and lost their capacity to conceive seed and produce the wisdom of the kingdom. And they took mankind into a fallen age of corrupted wisdom. And in the temptation of Jesus, the rock, when the devil came to him after Jesus had fasted 40 days and he tempted him on three things, the whole issue was he's trying to test whether Jesus believed in his identity. If you be the son of God, do this, do this. But one of the things he said, he showed him the splendor of the kingdoms of all the worlds. Now the devil was able to do that. He knew Jesus could see in the spirit world. And he showed him the splendor of all these kingdoms in the world. And he says, I will give you all of these kingdoms. If you will just bow down, not just worship friends. The devil wants you bow down and you worship me and I'll give you these kingdoms. Now Jesus did not say you have no authority or any rights to offer me these kingdoms. He didn't argue that. He didn't dispute that. Because Adam, who had been given dominion and authority to multiply and to reign and govern this earth. God could have governed the whole earth directly and directly sovereignly. But once he gave that authorization by his divine legislation to Adam and Eve to have dominion, to rule, to govern, and to subdue, and multiply and be fr fruitful, once he had given that to man, then he had to cooperate with man and could not bypass man and do what he wanted to because he had violated his own promise to Adam and Eve. But he was not ambushed by the whole thing because he had already seen this before time began. And so Satan stole God-like authority that had been given to Adam and became the temporary God of this world. And he literally was the governing, corrupting influence over every culture on the planet. And Jesus was offered that by the devil. And Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone will you serve. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, all authority now in heaven and earth is given to me. Now go and disciple nations. Who? Missionaries? Not missionaries. The church. The church may resource apostles and prophets. Not missionaries. Apostles and prophets. 
and ministry teams that go into nations and plant churches like we go into Central Asia into places most people haven't even heard those countries exist. Muslim countries Glenda and I go into and see signs and wonders. Women throw off their burqa and come to Christ. There's a great danger in some of these countries as we've seen recently in where we go. But we are not missionaries. Or we, we are leading a church in Hong Kong, but we are not missionaries. There's an apostolic dimension. Paul the Apostle constantly inspired all the churches he was working with to see that the boundaries of the kingdom do not end at the borders of your local church, but you have an assignment to be the seed of Abraham and fill the earth with the grace of God. Fill the earth with the knowledge of God's glory. God's not going to sovereignly just fill the earth with the knowledge of His glory. He's going to fill it through a glorious church that lives when they come to church on Sunday morning uh, this is the best investment of my time I could ever make this is God's eternal purpose I'm not organic and I'm neither am I engineering I am balanced on this thing I will not forsake the gathering because that investment is an inv every tithe, every offering is not specific to one covenant. First fruits and tithes are in all the seven covenants in the Bible, including the final and last covenant, the everlasting covenant, the new covenant. Investment into the house of God, the local church, is the greatest investment to lay up treasures in heaven. Amen. Don't get your theology from Facebook. So the arrogance that parades itself in rebellion against the living God on this earth right now, where the idea of holiness is the most immoral behavior, where things that you could not, that the white house could be lit up with gay colors is astonishing to me. The agenda of a secular narrative to hijack the United States of America from the holy, majestic purpose and assignment to be the nation, the superpower that disseminates the power of the gospel into the nations of the earth. I am not against gays. I invite them and welcome them into our church. But it is not God's pattern of life. And we accept everybody because grace accepts heterosexuals have done lots of sins. And God doesn't grade us in sin is sin. And under the law, we are all guilty, totally. We all deserve lost eternity. But I'm just saying when local government, my God. The moral decline in the United States of America is because the church has forgotten her identity. She's forgotten that all these corrupted governments and kingdoms with their dazzling gold and mighty power are all coming down. And the only thing that will transfer into eternity is the church. All this stuff that looks so great now. That Christians can be seduced into greed. Seduced into living an immoral life and say, I'm in grace now. It's all fine. La, 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 la. I can do what I want. I just float in the church when I feel like it. That is seduction of a corrupted wisdom that's not from above. That is not divine reasoning. That's thinking more about the things of man than the things of God. And the things that we're trying to prop up and think are so important, they're all coming down. Babylon's coming down. Revelation says that Babylon will come down in half an hour because of the apostles and prophets and the priests of God. It's all coming down. The economic, political, religious system is going to come down. And out of that is going to emerge the church. And the church will live in an economic system. That's the power of the blessing. The church is not going to run after money. Money's going to run after us. Church won't run after opportunities. Opportunities will run after us. Fish swam into Peter's nets. Clients and customers will come to your business. Amen. You will know what to invest in and what not to invest in. You will be led by wisdom in God. Can you say amen? amen. See, let me go through this. I got... Uh, I got uh, 16 minutes left, so are you guys still with me here? Yeah. You belong to the church. Amen. You don't attend church. The church attends the building. But it does gather, and it gathers with discipline. In 38 years of preaching, I've missed preaching once because I wasn't well. 38 years. You say, why did you miss once? You must have been sick other times. 
I haven't been sick that much, but yeah, I was sick other times, so I just, I just preached anyway, because who cares? I'm from that old school. I like that old school. I love the millennials, but they need to learn a little bit about the old school. The old-fashioned things are not that old-fashioned. We were still alive when the dinosaurs were on the planet. <laughs> but we were still alive when truth was absolute. And it's not about my subjective feeling about what is truth. This God is the infinite reference point that makes finite points meaningful. If you take away an infinite reference point, every finite point is meaningless and absurd and just your subjective opinion. And how do you know your opinion's right and that person's opinion is wrong? You don't know. So political identity begins to get very aggressive and very hateful about anyone who differs with your opinion. But they say they're tolerant. They cannot be tolerant because they do not have an infinite reference point to determine what's right and what's wrong. So they have to hate anybody who disagrees with them because their identity is wrapped up with a finite point of view. Whereas our identity should be wrapped up with an infinite point of view. The God who created the heavens and the earth. And if someone wants to come to you and tell me that 38% of Americans now do not believe in, in creation as stated in Genesis, but 30, only 38% believe that. The rest of Americans now believe that God used evolution. I mean, I just think, have they studied? I've studied science. I've studied macroevolution. I've studied microevolution. I've studied, I'm not saying we're 7,000, 8,000 years old. I don't believe we're billions of years old either. But science is useless when it comes to macroevolution. There is no scientific mechanics to describe the transition from one species to the next species. There's no evidence whatsoever. That is a blind faith religion, a leap. And the teachers just keep saying it. And Hitler said, if I tell lies often enough, people will finally believe it's the truth. And so Americans, by principalities and powers, are being influenced to believe that God in his glory didn't speak creation into being, but used an evolutionary process. Yet the, nothing shows that to be scientifically accurate. I just think, why are we worshipping bow dying at the idol of science? Yeah. Right. I've studied science. I believe in science. But science really should not become a religion. It's meant to be a science, an objective, provable, clinical analysis. But they become religious in their science. I better be quiet because I'm going to go into areas that are going to upset people. Ben is getting nervous now. <laughs> There's very good science on both sides of the issue of climate change. It just depends on what side you're listening to. That's not the big issue for me. I know the oceans are not going to cover the earth because my God took an oath that I'll never drown the earth again. Christians, if you listen to what people are saying in the name of science, then you need to go study science, study the Word of God, get revelation, but stay stable because this world is so unstable. It's schizophrenic right now. People are getting very weird. Their facial expressions, the way they talk, they have lost their identity. They don't have any security, and they're just mad with anyone who doesn't believe what they find out point of view. We shouldn't be like that. We have an infinite reference point called the revelation of God and science. Also, I studied the science. I was a history teacher and I understood the classical documents of the New Testament are superior to any other historical documents on earth. And I could tell you about that for about half an hour. This book is intellectually reliable. But I don't read it just because it's intellectually reliable, but I can prove it's intellectually reliable. But I read it because it's inspired God-breathed book that produces signs and wonders. These are God-generated words. And when you speak them, supernatural miracles happen. Oh, that so many Americans have lost this and are not even engaged in this anymore. Because they've been hijacked by principalities and powers. But God's intent is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, which is the cross, be revealed to the principalities and powers according to his eternal intent that is accomplished in Christ Jesus. Yeah. How can anyone be a casual about the church? Only reason is they don't have clear doctrine and they don't know what the purpose of the church is. And they expect the church to behave perfect when they're not behaving perfect. 
And the imperfect people leave an imperfect church because they're offended by the imperfect things and people. So I just go, my God, man, did you hear what you said? And you're meant to be a person who believes in grace. So let me quickly close in the next 10 minutes. I'm going to take you through the book of Revelation in 10 minutes. Are you ready for that? All right, so I can't read it. I have to quote it. Okay, I'm going to take you through the highlights where this is this book of Ephesians. Did I say Revelation? Okay, sorry, not Revelation. Book of Ephesians. A book of, yeah, not, uh, that's too many chapters. Okay. So. Okay, you want me to try that? Eschatology? <laughs> anyway, no one. Okay, we, Ephesians. For me personally, I believe Ephesians is the greatest revelation of the church. So this is what you'll see Paul say through the book of, I'm really going to keep 10 minutes, so Glenda just kick me off the stage. You'll see Paul say this statement uh, in the NIV, NIV, he says it three times, but then he says two other times the equivalent of the phrase I'm going to give you. He says, for this reason, he says it three times, for this reason, for this reason, for this reason, therefore I say to you, which means for this reason. So the pattern through the book is simply this, and no one taught me this, and I didn't read this somewhere. I just read through the book of Ephesians over and over again, and then you suddenly get the big picture, what Paul's, he's talking about the church. That's the whole thing. Because the church was under siege then, and he got the elders, and he said, look after yourselves and the flock to which God's made you overseers, for from, and by his own blood, the blood of God, for from your own number, people will arise and distort the truth to take disciples after themselves. So be on your guard, for I've warned you about this night and day for three, three, I've warned you about this night and day in tears for three years. Now those elders didn't really listen. They weren't listening. The, the fact that people come into churches, distort the truth from what they see on Facebook and all these other philosophies and these, this kind of stuff over here and, and, and this kind of stuff over here. <laughs> And it's like they either here distorting the truth or they're here distorting the truth. Just come and be, you know, or they're over here just legalistic and over engineering technocrats. We don't need to be either of those. We're in the middle. We're balanced. We stick with scripture. So he says, for this reason. And so what he does is he writes the most profound, breathtaking revelation about the church for about. I mean, long sentences, like whole paragraphs. And yet right at the end of that, he says, and for this reason. And then he tells you the reason why you pray this way. And then he finishes why you should pray that way. And then he goes on profound revelation, profound insights about the church. And then he goes, and for this reason, this is how you pray. Or this is how you do. So... Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about how you're in Christ, you're predestinated in His love, and oh, you're so precious to Him. And then he comes to verse 15, he says, and for this reason, ever since Ephesians, I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, all the brothers, I have not stopped praying for you. I have not stopped praying to the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He would give you the spirit of wisdom, and revelation that you're an epic gnosis, know him experientially better, and that you would know, church, the hope of your calling, which is that you are the riches of the glorious inheritance of God amongst his holy people, and that you would know the power that is towards you who believe. It is like the working of his mighty power, his incomparable power that exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and ascended him on high above all principalities, powers and mights, names and titles, not only in this age, but in the age to come and made him to be the head over all all things and put all things under his feet for the church the fullness of him that fills everything in every way yes. see everything was not put under Jesus feet because we weren't everything of this world system everything of these Babylonian everything of these of these empires and kingdoms that exist today, all of them 
we put under his feet for the church. Because built on this rock, not cut with human sand, sands, hands, the gates of hell cannot prevail against that church. And let me tell you, you don't have to work at being in unity with other churches. If they built on this revelation, they are resonating with you. And if they're not built on this, they are not resonating. They've got a religious agenda. There's a little bit of law mixed in there, a little bit of grace, a little bit of church growth principles, a lot of academic business principles on how to make church successful. Quite a lot of the stuff over here, technocrat, scripted, organized. This group over here don't grow and don't actually ever increase because they, they end up all fighting each other because they're just selfish. This group do grow because they're technocrats and they're engineering everything. But if you built on the rock of revelation, not cut with human hands, that's what your church, number one, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You will reveal the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers, not just by praying, but what you'll do is you'll reveal it by, by the fact that you don't walk in their wisdom, their corrupted wisdom. You walk in the wisdom of the cross, destined for your glory before time began. If I had the rulers of this world known, they would have never have crucified the Lord of glory. And the rulers of this world are coming to nothing. God chooses the weak and the foolish and not many noble to confound the wisdom of the wise and to bring to nothing that, that which is it is. He chooses that which is not to bring to nothing that which is. He chooses that which is not to bring to nothing that which is. The established cultures, kingdoms, philosophies, ideologies in this world, with all of their corrupted, proud, arrogant wisdom, is coming down. What does that look like, Rob? It looks beautiful. It looks like a rock becoming a mountain that fills the earth. And the mountain of the Lord will be exalted and the nations will beat their swords into plows and they will war no more and they will go to the mountain of the Lord. God's dream and plan for this earth was never to colonize it. He created it for Eden-like atmosphere. An illegal enemy intruded and colonized it illegally. I love the fact that America does not colonize nations. It helps nations overcome bullies and then releases them back into independence. America refused to be colonized by Great Britain and said, we will not come under a king, a human king. Our king is the king of kings. Yes. As founding fathers, they weren't all just brilliant, spiritual Christians, but God's commitment to this nation caused, gave those founding fathers profound wisdom to write a constitution and a bill of rights that produced a superpower. This superpower is not being produced by human engineering and wisdom. It was built on the blueprint of divine wisdom and set into a constitution and a bill of rights that secular humanism under principalities and powers have tried to completely demolish and evict from this great nation. And half the church was asleep while it was happening and half the church was agreeing with it. But when she wakes up, when the prince... God Jesus comes and kisses the slumbering blood and she awakens to the urgency of the hour and why going to church on Sunday morning is not just a religious duty. It is a fabulous and glorious investment of your future to be equipped by the word of God, to assemble in an atmosphere and a realm of faith, to bring unbelievers in and the realm of faith touches their hearts. The next minute they're undone and they're crying and touched by his love. To go in as the church in salt and life and get into politics. I was in Washington this year, at the beginning of this year, at the prayer breakfast for four days. I prophesied of a congressman and senators from the United States of America and from different parts around the world. I met people that are presidents and governors and they've invited me to the country to come and hold big crusades. Let me tell you, when you walk before God in faithfulness, your gift will open doors for you and you will come into places where you will have influence in this earth. Everybody in here has the investment of God in you. There are people here, you've got best-selling books on the inside of you that are going to be written and New York best-selling is going to publish your books and you're going to become a millionaire through those books alone. There are every one of you in here. Adam wanted a wife, but he already had her 
on the inside of her. The gross wealth of heaven was transferred into your spirit the day you got born again. It's bringing up that wisdom. You may not get $10 million jumped on your head from heaven. In fact, I doubt you will. But you will get a $10 million business plan put into your spirit that will come up into your consciousness. As you walk in the spirit of God, you'll prosper and you'll walk in the ways of God. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that he had prepared in advance for you to walk in. You are predestined in his love. You have a destiny. You have an appointment. You have a vision. You have a purpose. And you're living with purpose and vision. And you do not make your vision. Your vision makes you. And you do not hold on to your vision. Your vision holds on to you. And you can win in life because life will be in your vision. And your vision will give you the will to win. You do not need much to win at all. You just need one thing to win. And that's the will to win and to be faithful to Jesus. And your vision will pull you. The vision he has for his church will pull you into a winning attitude. You'll go through sacrifices, difficulties, setbacks, hardships, betrayals, treason against you, and your vision will just pull you into your future. For Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was put in jail for this gospel. Paul was whipped for this gospel. Paul was abandoned for this gospel. Paul was lied and slandered about for this gospel. And he said, these light and momentary afflictions are storing up for me an eternal weight of glory. He says, now there's laid up for me a prize. What was Paul about? He was about the church. Why was he about the church? Because the Bible says the church is the glorious riches of God's inheritance. And when Paul, as Saul, was trying to kill the church and murder the church and imprison the church, he bumped in to the rock cut without human hands on the road to Damascus. He'd been killing Christians and murdering the church. He goes down, slain in the spirit, boom, to the ground. And he hears the voice of Jesus. And Jesus does not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because when you touch his bride, when you touch his church, you're offending him. And God's strategy to stop Paul was to turn him into a grace champion who got revelation of the church and was willing to suffer inconvenience himself, go naked, go without food, be attacked by rivers, be attacked by false brothers, betrayed. And he found sufficiency of grace to delight in hardships, insults, and difficulties for the church because he had a vision that did not come from earth, but he had vision that he got when he was caught up into the third heaven. And he saw all those old covenant scriptures that he was the master Hebrew scholar. He suddenly saw them by revelation that they pointed to Christ and the church.